So thank you, Shane, for that very kind introduction. Um, yeah, I'm delighted to be here speaking to you all about, I guess, the why, what, and how of trees in urban areas. Before I get stuck into it, though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're gathered here today, which is the Wadarungan people here in Geelong. I acknowledge them as the traditional owners of the lands, seas, and skies on which we're gathered here today. And I pay my respects to our elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people residing in Geelong. So yes, VTIO, and the reason I know it was 2017, so I actually went and looked it up <laughs> before I came here to present as a bit of a refresher. And yeah, Shane very kindly invited me to present at the Professional Development Day in 2017. That was in Chadston, I think, at the time. Um, and I got as much out of that day as hopefully the people listening to me got, because I was coming from the research perspective, which is all well and good as we build our evidence base, but I find it so valuable to listen to the conversations that happen in rooms like this and really kind of practical considerations they have to take into place when looking to add green space into our grey urban spaces. So after completing my PhD and working a few years in research, I've now landed myself in a position working at Mosaic Insights, who I think is kind of a nice little fit for my skill set, because it's all about how do we take that research evidence base and apply it to really deliver good outcomes on the ground and fit for purpose solutions within the very challenging environments we all work. And our mission is to create a future of sustainable, livable and resilient communities, cities, regions and landscapes. And we do this through nature-based solutions, green infrastructure networks, urban forestry strategies, green space planning, however you want to term it. Basically, it's just about trying to bring the green into the grey. How we achieve this uh, mission is through shaping cities and, importantly, the communities that live within those cities. So you always need to understand the people and place in which we're developing and planning these trees and green spaces. And we do this through both a data-driven and spatial approach but that's very firmly embedded within a social science understanding. Again, understanding the people, communities, and place, and why we do what we do. Mosaic are part of um, a broader kind of group, and you might have heard of Alluvium, who do a lot of kind of environmental engineering and hydrology. We also sit alongside our sister companies of Natural Capital Economics, which as Rob highlighted in his presentation, you need to be able to account for the return on investment of what we're doing and what the bang for buck is. And also we have our sister company, EcoFutures, who do the kind of ecology and conservation side of it because it's quite multi-layered, this uh, space of green infrastructure in cities and understanding the multiple co-benefits and outcomes and how we plan for and evaluate those is important. So always good to have an economist or ecologist on call in the work that we do. And full disclosure, I'm, I would consider myself a social scientist, so probably way out of my depth to be presenting at events like this. But um, as I said, I always see it as a two-way learning street when I come to these um, professional development days. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of, I guess, the perspective and experience that I'm speaking from. And for today's talk, I'm going to structure it around the golden circle. So I don't know if you've come across this. It's a famous like TED talk by Simon Sinek, where he just kind of talks about the importance of understanding why you do what you do and how you do what you do, and not just the what of what you do. So that's how I'll structure today. And we'll start off with the why, which is always a good um, place to start. And as Shane said, when I did the presentation in 2017, my headspace was very much in the why, because I was all about the research and collecting the data and the evidence and the justification for why we need green space and trees and cities. I come from kind of the health and social well-being side of why trees are good in cities. And this is the WHO um, definition of what health is, and comes from the Ottawa Charter of Health. And it's more than just the absence of disease or infirmity, and it's that kind of holistic model of health that looks at the physical, mental, and social well-being. 
And the good news is that since I presented in 2017, there's now a very well-established research evidence base that demonstrates in a quantifiable way that having access to nature and cities is good for physical health. It encourages us to get outdoors and active. It's good for our mental health. It provides spaces for relaxation and restoration in very busy, um, intense urban cities at times. And it supports social well-being. So it provides platforms for people to come together, to interact, to build that sense of community cohesion. And when you look at trees specifically, there's also a lot of um, great research papers that quantify the impact of trees on health and well-being. So for example, this study from Toronto and Canada showed that 10 extra trees per city block improves health perception in a ways that is comparable to a um, $10,000 uplift in annual salary. This um, study of asthma rates in the US looking at children showed that 343 extra trees per kilometer squared reduced prevalence of asthma by 24%. So that's true the role that trees play in um, improving air quality. 10% increase in tree canopy can reduce perceptions of crime by 12%. Again, because it's activating that kind of social capital and encouraging social interactions of people getting outdoors more. And can even lower rates of antidepressant prescriptions as well, with this study that looked at urban canopy. So as I said, the research has given us a really strong case for why we need trees in our cities. It's also started to help point us in the direction of what we need with regards to trees. So over the last probably year or two, I've seen this, um, the three, and apologies for the Irish accent, I didn't realize there's so many trees in the, <laughs> this presentation but it's the 330-300 rule. Um, and it's picking up a lot of traction. So this basically has summarized all of the evidence base and says, look, based on what we've um, seen and all the data, there's good support to say that having three trees within um, view of every house can help promote those health and wellbeing benefits that 30% urban canopy target per neighborhood has also demonstrated benefits for things like urban cooling, as well as the broader health, well-being, and environmental benefits. And that every resident should have access to a park or urban green space within 300 meters of their home. This is a really important one as well, because sometimes cities can unintentionally end up with nice suburbs that have the nice green spaces, and then the less nice suburbs have less or no access to green space. And this is a real challenge when you look at equitable access and addressing health inequalities. And it shouldn't be just that you can afford to live in a nice place so you get the health benefits. It should be universal access across our whole city environment. There's also been some, um, so this is a study from Philadelphia last year that looked at how achieving that 30% urban canopy target would improve the health of residents of Philadelphia. And they found that it would actually reduce premature deaths annually in the range of 430 people, which is really quantifiable and significant case <laughs> that we can um, use to really support why we do the work we do. And we're starting to see this, um, I'm sure you've come across the 30% urban tree canopy somewhere, because um, it's starting to be picked up quite a lot. So for example, in the ACT, they have had this 30% um, tree canopy target by 2045. I looked up Geelong just out of curiosity, seeing as this is where we're speaking. And they have um, a 25% urban canopy target over the next 30 years period which is interesting that it's 25 instead of 30. But then if you look at this recent policy brief, which is developed by UNECE, who are basically the, the sustainable development goals people, they kind of provided, um, they support this 330, 300 rule. But there's this nice little sentence at the end that's while it's all based on the latest and greatest evidence, they do recognize that given the great diversity of cities, the most appropriate targets for a given city should consider the local context. And this is, um, yeah, the real catch, I guess. 
So while we have the science telling us why we need to do what we do, and it's just proving what we've all intuitively known for a very long time, and we now have this direction of what we need to get to, it's that how bit that is tricky. <laughs> and how do you kind of take into consideration that local context to set fit for purpose targets that are achievable and meaningful? And that's why, again, I love coming to events like this, because you guys, I see, are kind of the front line <laughs> of the how in um, green space and cities. And this is from yesterday's event that was held in Eastern Park. So I'm gonna talk about, I guess, what we do at Mosaic Insights and how we try to bridge that understanding from the why to the how. And we do it kind of in three ways. And I'll talk through and give examples supporting each of these three ways. So we do a lot of work with mostly local and state governments to help them to design urban forest strategies that take into account that local context to set those fit for purpose targets around urban canopy. We then use those kind of data driven and social science informed approaches to um, help them implement those urban forest strategies. And then the third part, which doesn't get as much um, attention but is increasingly more valuable, is how you evaluate the actual success and impact of those urban forest strategies. So there's no point putting a tree in the ground and hoping that, yeah, everyone's gonna be socially connected now and well-being will be increased and cities will be cool. You have to go back and I love that, um, the five to 10 measuring tape that Rob talked about in his presentation, because yeah, it's very relevant. So starting off with the design of urban forest strategies, we do a lot of, um, kind of highly collaborative work with, as I said, mostly local governments to help them design um, meaningful urban forest strategies. So this one's from the Queen Bean Palarang Regional Council, which as you'll see in the map is located just south of Wollongong in New South Wales and borders the ACT um, state border as well. What we did is they had kind of four urban districts and they wanted us to map out what the current canopy was. We looked at a whole range of different land uses across that. We um, mapped the targets and how they're tracking towards achieving like a 30% urban canopy rate and what the other land uses were. We then had a stakeholder workshop where we came up with a whole range of strategies and then kind of co-design and collaboratively came to the prioritize strategies for Queenbean. And as you'll see here, they kind of range across the practical, you know, expand data collection and monitoring of the urban forest, coordinating the management, planting, um, and afterlife care of trees, reviewing the planning and policy and development controls, and increasing council's capacity um, to actually achieve all of that urban forest management. But a really important one as well is that strategy one, which is around build awareness and encourage participation in urban greening. And it's quite nice actually to follow the pre presentation I just did, because you can't overlook the importance of a sense of stewardship or ownership of local community with their urban forests and green infrastructure. And as well avoiding the, I guess, adverse outcomes where you have a lot of resistance potentially from community who don't want trees in their backyard or under front of their houses and potential um, vandalism of trees as well when they're first planted. So these five strategies kind of were the backbone of the urban forest strategy we developed. And through delivering these strategies and we had supporting actions, the aim was that we would um, end up with a resilient urban forest that was fairly distributed. Again, that real importance of equity and addressing potential health inequalities among community and making sure that those who need it most have access to these kind of health promoting resources. Um, a cooler, greener urban environment, increased biodiversity and tree canopy, and then an actively managed urban forest where it's coordinated across all the various departments of council, but also has community engaged in that management as well. We've gone through a similar process for the city of Frankston here in Melbourne. 
um, where we've gone down to the precinct level. And a really important uh, aspect of the, this urban forest plan was around maintaining the character. So they have a lot of kind of heritage and a particular aesthetic they want to maintain. So how you kind of plan your tree selection around, you know, enhancing and maintaining that character of the region as well. And again, Banyul is another um, urban forest strategy we're working on. So that's all about how we kind of work with um, clients to develop meaningful urban forest strategies for their areas to help them achieve the various outcomes, whether it's social, environmental, urban cooling, um, equity that they want to achieve. The next aspect of the how is, okay, we have these wonderful plans. How do we actually go about implementing them? And for this one, I'll talk about work we're currently doing with Waverley um, City Council. So this is a council based within the Sydney urban footprint, just on the coast, as you can see in the plan here. And again, they have an uh, urban canopy target of 25% by 2030. And this project really brings, um, both, I guess, your traditional tree inventory processes and on-ground collection with kind of more data-driven and data linkage approaches. So we wanted to build this um, on-ground geolocated assessment of street and park trees that looked at a wide range of attributes of street trees. So tree health, species mix, age, diversity, the physical condition, and the, the surrounding infrastructure. This sounds like a lot of jargon on a slide, so I'll show you what that actually looks like. So it's basically like a bespoke dashboard that we developed. I would love to have had the IT whiz be able to show you this live, because it's a lot of fun to play with, or maybe that's just me being a, a, a science nerd. But basically, this is the overview of the whole um, City of Waverley footprint. And you have all of the attributes listed along, so the structure, age, health, the origins, so it's exotic, native, indigenous, the tree height. Um, so that's the full overview. And then you can zoom in to a specific part of the urban area, and you can select particular indicators. So if you just want to look at good structure, mature age, and good health, to see where those trees are, and whether, what their origin is, you can select the indicators, as you can see here, and they come up highlighted in green on the map. This is really important as well, because as I mentioned previously about, I guess, understanding who benefits and who doesn't, from having access to trees in their neighborhood, you can overlay this with the demographics of your population to look at where people who, you know, might have experienced disabilities or maybe of older age or may have mobility issues with accessing green space, where they live and are they being well serviced by the trees that we plant or is there kind of a, a gap where they don't have access and don't get those benefits. The final one to chat about is, and as I said, this is the area we need to get a bit better in working at, is revisiting our projects to evaluate what the success of them was, what impact did they actually have? Because we have all this research evidence saying, yep, yeah, it delivers social, mental health and well-being, urban cooling, biodiversity, but we don't actually know, and it's quite difficult to do this, but we've just started a project with the New South Wales Department of Environment and Planning. I don't know if you've heard about their five million trees program. So it started off as one million trees, and now it's been extended to five million trees by 2030, and it started off as a premier's priority as well. So there's a lot of momentum and support around this project. We've been asked to come in and evaluate the effectiveness of this program. So they have a range of case studies. This is just a snapshot where they've planted trees and they've gone back into the survival rate and they know how much it cost. And here's some examples of those tree plantings. So they're quite um, varied in by location, kind of where types of trees, where they are, maturity of trees. And what they've asked us to do is evaluate the progress to date. And again, going back to um, Rob's comment of, you know, it's a five to ten year time frame you're looking at when you're looking at the real outcomes. 
So this is just that first snapshot of how we're tracking to date. So how is it making progress towards achieving that tree canopy cover target for Greater Sydney? How is it achieving its urban cooling objectives and addressing um, urban heat, which in the western suburbs of Sydney is a real uh, challenge of urgency, I would say. How is it delivering those environmental co-benefits? So also um, addressing biodiversity targets as well. How is it delivering those social and health impact benefits that we have the research that tells us this is likely to happen, but how do we actually quantify that? And then importantly, this last one around how is it helping to um, improve or enhance, I guess, communities' attitudes and values towards urban trees, because we do still have that contention point where new sal samplings get vandalised and really kind of building, bringing community on the journey, I guess, as to why it's a good thing to have more trees um, in their neighbourhood. So that's just um, a bit of a whistle-stop tour of some projects we're working on that help us address the how. I'll also, just for a bit of fun, throw in some slides of how not to do it. And these are just kind of um, observations I've collected on various travels. So this is um, in Kingston in London, which is quite an upper class fancy area of London that I was just wandering through mistakenly one day. And you'll see you have all of these nice white pillars on one side. And whenever I'm in a city, my philosophy is walk down the green side of the street. So I immediately cross over because like, oh, look at that lovely park. I'm going to direct my route through there and get my health and well-being benefits <laughs> as I walk around. So all excited to go into this park. And I met with this wrought iron fence with the <laughs> following sign. And so no dogs, please. No people of my background <laughs> allowed into the, this park. And I just really, I, I share this a lot because it really hammers home for me the why are we doing what we're doing. It's not just to serve the privileged few, few who get to live in these nice neighbourhoods. It really has to be to have everyone has access to trees and cool, shading, green spaces where they live. Another example of who do we design these spaces for. So the picture on the left is from Toronto and Canada, I believe. And you see, and you see examples of this everywhere. This isn't me just giving out about Canada. We have this kind of exclusion or defensive architecture that you know, prevents people from sleeping on benches. Whereas here on the right is an example from South Bank in Brisbane, which is where I've come from, where they have park benches that are accessible for wheelchair users. So you kind of always have to have front and centre why we do what we do and who we do it for and think about the people and communities and places behind where we do our work. This is another terrific, very kind of high profile example of what was a great idea, but probably didn't have much foresight. This is the High Line in New York, which I don't know if you've heard about it, but it was a disused overhead railway that they've converted into a linear park and has become this wonderful showcase of repurposing infrastructure, including green space into grey. But what they didn't account for was that it would raise the rental and housing prices in the local neighbourhoods. So all they kind of ended up doing was displacing a lot of the local community who actually would have really benefited from having a nice park to visit. So just kind of, yeah, always having that social science underpinning of the work we do to understand and avoid any potential perverse outcomes. So in summary, the scientists and researchers have done a great job of giving us evidence base for justifying why we do what we do for those. And the short story is, is that trees are good news. They make cities cooler, healthier, more livable, resilient, and sustainable. So great job, everyone. Keep doing what you're doing. The science has gone a bit further to start provide, um, I guess, targets and directions on what we need to do. And this 330, 300 rule seems to be getting a lot of support. And then finally, the how, it just needs a bit of muddling and figuring out and working together collaboratively to, I guess, shape cities and communities for good outcomes and using both the data and the social science to really understand fit for purpose solutions and 
That's a lot of the work we do here at Mosaic Insights. So just for a shameless plug at the end, <laughs> I'm Anne, I'm based in Brisbane. Feel free to reach out and contact me at any stage. I'm also around for the rest of the day, so just come have a chat. In Sydney, we have Jan, who's also very approachable to reach out to as well. And in Melbourne, we have Dom Blackham, whose contact details are there. So yeah, that's basically me in a nutshell. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, that's like basically my nine to five job, <laughs> trying to figure out that, that very tricky question. Because attribution is very tricky, particularly like for example, the five million trees program we're evaluating, where the trees aren't even established enough yet that you would suspect they will be having a tangible or quantifiable impact on social um, health and well-being. So a lot of what we'll be doing there is establishing kind of the methods and baseline for how you then track into the future if it's having an impact. I tend to use mixed method approaches a lot. So you might do surveys where you ask people about, you know, their frequency of use of a park after you've done a particular tree planting. You know, there's indicators and scales to measure their social well-being and mental health and things. And then I also like to kind of contextualize that with some interviews to really kind of, because it's so subjective as well, particularly in the mental health and wellbeing space, because how I experience a green space and the benefits I drive be completely different from you to you based on your own experience and preferences. So it's always good to understand where people are coming from and what that context is. But yeah, there's, there's ways around it, it's not easy. <laughs> Am I off the hook? <laughs> Yeah, so the question was how we go about getting community to feel some kind of stewardship or ownership about trees. Um, I, I can tell you what not to do. Don't give them a fact sheet <laughs> with technical information on it. it. You really have to, I know this sounds a bit tokenistic, but you really have to bring community on a journey. And you really have to understand their very genuine concerns and fears. Like, a lot of, you know, they might be scared that a cyclone comes through and knocks a tree in their house. Like, that's a very valid concern to have. So it's not just trying to bash them over the head with more information and knowledge, but really kind of understanding where they're coming from, addressing their fears and barriers. Uh, try, like, involve them in the process. So, you know, get their feedback and um, co-design a bit with them as opposed to just, this is what's happening deal with it, because that's when you get a lot of resistance and pushback. So yeah, it's, it's time consuming and resource intense, but when you don't do it, you, get a, uh, yeah, it, you don't get an outcome that's good for anyone. So yeah, bring community and journey, co-design with them, understand their values and fears about trees, and yeah, work it that way. Thank you, Dr. Ryan, for your